Hello, I'm Steve Lebetkin. I'm here to talk to you today about the high art of music composition and the competing trends for quality in music composition for film in the current environment. Recently, John Burlingham, the nation's leading writer on the subject of music for films and television, penned an article for Variety on what he sees as the new trend in concert halls, original concert music by movie composers, but without images. Composers he refers to specifically include James Newton Howard's Cello Concerto, Danny Elfman's Violin Concerto, a song cycle by Jeff Beale, Lalo Schifrin's Tuba Concerto, a symphony by Catherine Bostick, a symphonic work by Michael Giacchino, and about a dozen others. What is important to note is that many a Hollywood composer over the years aspired for the credibility and artistic recognition of the concert hall whose economic benefits pale to those of the commercial media world. Among other things, composers are frustrated with the practice of music editors and directors chopping their work into little pieces and sprinkling them around a film in an order that often does not make a great deal of sense musically. The concert hall eliminates that issue. But it wasn't always this way. Occasionally, Hollywood directors will reach out to composers like John Crigliano, John Adams, Toro Takamitsu, and others for the credible and well-trained composers from the symphonic world to achieve a more integrated marriage between picture and music, where the desired results include the achievement of films that last and have greater longitudinal value as reflected in a significant return on equity and other desirable filmatic outcomes. Let's go back a bit and look at the present through the historical lens of how this began. Until around 1930, the great classical and symphonic composer Carol Rathaus, K-A-R-O-L and R-A-T-H-A-U-S, was gaining a reputation for stage music for various plays running Berlin at the time. I am a direct musical descendant of Rathaus, whose three primary disciples were my composition teachers in the last half of the 20th century, and of several other notable composers, including the late Marv Hamlisch. Radhaus collaborated with the writer Alfred Doblin, author of the seminal interwar novel Berlin Alexanderplatz. Radhaus and Doblin were being talked about as competition to Brecht and Weil. The great Russian film director Fajedor Ozeb approached Radhaus and Doblin. Until this time, people were still unsure how to deal with music and cinema. Silent films had offered an opportunity to a number of important serious music composers like Edmund Meisel and Serge Prokofiev, but by and large, movie theaters kept stock scores of moods that were randomly added to the films either as suggestions of the studios or the music director of the movie theater. Eisenstein wrote in his memoirs that when he filmed Battleship Potemkin, his original idea was to have every country produce its own soundtrack. Eisenstein turned to Prokofiev for his later films, including sound films. Music was not seen as adding to the dramatic narrative, but as underling, underlying the narrative already present. For that reason, Ozep handed Rathaus the script of his film Der Murder Dmitri Karamazov, with the instruction to write the score first so that he could shoot the film afterwards to his soundtrack. Yes, you heard me. The score was written first something unheard of today in the world of chopped up scores re-sprinkled around film footage. And that's how the film and score of The Brothers Karamazov was born. Redhouse prestige as a film composer was largely based on the fact that in 1930, he was the first serious music composer to write a complete film score. Until then, it was considered unworthy of serious composers to supply the sort of pastiche cinema demanded. Film and its interaction with music became more sophisticated very quickly, and by the time Eisler and Adorno wrote their book on composing for the movies, they had already established how music carried a different layer of narrative to the spoken and visual action. In fact, Eisler went so far as to create a certain visual dialectic, or synthesis of experience created by placing music under the action that did not augment the action, but actually complemented it. He could heighten the effects of the visual by placing slow, dreamy music under an action scene, or the very opposite by placing agitated music under a slow, romantic scene. 
By doing this, he added an additional layer of dramatic narrative. This has become the basis of modern film composition to this day, the recognition of music as augmenting the narrative rather than simply underlining it. Great musicians coming to Hollywood started to lift the standards of expectations and possibilities. Max Steiner was hired to make the monkey puppet King Kong scary, and for the first time, directors realized that the music added to the dramatic narrative. Until then, they assumed music was simply there to underline the dramatic narrative they had already established. Since that time, music has diverged again into sound design, and the assertion of a simple chord, the rumble of a diminished interval or single note on a cello, can drive the narrative forward, offering additional information on the individual or manipulating the dramatic anticipation of the audience. Moving back to the present time, we live in an era of competing standards for what is desirable and acceptable in the world of music for media. On the one hand, we see a huge influx of media composers that are entering the fray with hard drives filled up with sound design samples and production capability. While this has brought down the cost of producing music for media, it has also resulted in a trend that has been a real drag on the quality of the music composed to film. But what is interesting about this is that some of the composers themselves are now gravitating back to the concert hall, perhaps from a thirst and genuine desire to raise the bar of what they do and contribute to society. Recently, Conrad Pope, a wonderful composer and orchestrator, said, quote, Your orchestral demo score from deepest Eastern Europe proves you are a master of orchestration, certainly the equal of Ravel or what the hell John Williams. If your orchestra has more than 50 musicians, it takes a genius for screwing up to make it not sound like something. You really have to know what you're doing if you have 35 and under. Then you actually have to write some music and know how each instrument functions in the musical fabric." End quote. Pope went on to say, quote, MIDI always lies. MIDI without the knowledge of the orchestra is simply a big organ. A flute can be as loud as a trumpet. My favorite is when people tell me they've sequenced my orchestrations to John Williams and the woodwinds don't sound like the recording." End quote. I've spent my life studying and composing the very best music that I can, that reaches audience. Music that has an arch, tells a story, with a visual, ballet, song, or instrumental. Music that works with or without the medium for which it was originally intended. I have surrounded myself with musicians and production professionals that are the best in class, that combine a, in a credible way music and contemporary sound design, along with the technology solutions that bear repeated listenings. I hope this trend of music returning to the concert hall continues and precipitates a new and renewed trend of sourcing established symphonic composers to make a meaningful contribution once again to the world of media music. I'm Steve Lebeckman. Thank you for watching this video.